I mean, this is what I mean about the fallibility of, of economics. We're studying a tremendously complex uh, object, the economy. Well, it's, it's far too complex to be modeled purely by mathematical equations. Uh, and to give a hint of that complexity to the students, and some of the ways that it, economists can get around it, some of the different research projects, the computer simulations, uh, the laboratory experiments, the randomized trials, the ways that you're trying to expose the truth about the economy, I think, are profoundly engaging, as well as being very good economics. And I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of when we, we point out why, for example, the talking heads that you see on television, those economic experts who tell you what's going to happen to the stock market or the housing market, why they're always, always, always wrong. I mean, they should be wrong. Right? Economic theory says that they should be wrong, or at least they shouldn't be right any more than dart-throwing monkeys should be right. Um, the research has been done, by the way, and the monkeys win. <laughs> But I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what we should expect. You know, this, is our, this is our perfect market hypothesis. Uh, I liken it to trying to find the shortest queue at the supermarket. This is an easy way to understand it. You walk into the supermarket, you buy your stuff, you put them in the trolley, you get to the checkouts, and you think to yourself, right, where's the shortest queue? And you pause for a second, unleashing all your economic wisdom. <laughs> And you realize it's queue number seven. Oh, there's a grandmother just got in there with a big wadge of vouchers. Okay, not queue number seven. Queue number three. Oh no, someone's got in there as well. To be honest, you're better off just getting in the closest queue. And we know the reason for that. It's because if there was obviously a shortest queue, someone would get in it, it wouldn't be the shortest queue anymore. And that's a reasonably precise, it's not a perfectly precise, but it's, it's, it's not a bad analogy for the way that asset markets work, stock markets work, property markets work. If it was obviously such a cheap share, if it was so clear that China was what you should invest in, if it really was that clear, well, everybody would be in there already, and you've lost your chance to make money. Oh, sure, you know, we can question the details around the fringes of the efficient markets hypothesis, but we know that it's, it's roughly true. We know it's roughly true, and if it's roughly true, uh, all the guys who appear on you know, BBC Breakfast Business News are roughly wrong. <laughs> um, and that's an important insight. And, and, it, and it comes from economics. And, and it, it's important that we, that we get this over to the students because they're sitting there thinking, well, that guy told me this thing last week and it wasn't true. You know, therefore, economics is wrong. Um, the physicists mock the economists for not being able to forecast the stock market. Now, you know, we, maybe we deserve mockery, but given that the central economic result is you can't forecast the stock market, it seems a little bit harsh. It's like us mocking the physicists for not being able to make objects you know, float upwards. It's like, well, you know, that's not what we physicists are supposed to do. So these are limits to economics, but they're, they're important limits to economics. They're not, I think, limits that we should feel ashamed of. But by acknowledging them, we engage students all the more. Uh, and I think we become better economists ourselves. But the fact is, we are studying the most complex, the most fascinating, the most interesting, the most important object it's possible for humans to study, and that is the human economy, in all, in all its amazing complexity. <laughs> but bef before I take any questions you might have, I just wanted to read from the very first page of the book, with the undercover economist. <laughs> <laughs> You can pick up from the book <laughs> I checked. It's actually, it's actually in the W. H. Smiths uh, on the platform of Cambridge Station. <laughs> pick up, it's right next to Richard Dawkins' book. So you can pick up a copy on your way back to London. Um, anyway, the, the, the book is addressed, the introduction of the book is addressed to the reader who, like me, uh, picks up books in bookshops, doesn't pay for them, goes to sit in the bookshop cafe and reads them to decide whether they're any good. So you've got your coffee in front of you and you've got your book. Your coffee is intriguing to the economist because he doesn't know how to make a cappuccino and he knows that nobody else does either. After all, who could boast of being able to grow, pick, roast and blend coffee, raise and milk cows, roll steel, mold plastics, assemble them into espresso machine and finally shape ceramics into a cute little mug? Your cappuccino reflects the outcome of a system of staggering complexity. There isn't a single person in the world who knows what it takes to make a cappuccino? The economist knows that the cappuccino is the product of an incredible team effort. Not only that, 
there's nobody in charge of the team. The economist Paul Seabright reminds us of the pleas of the Soviet official trying to comprehend the Western system. Tell me, who's in charge of the supply of bread to London? The question's comical, but when you think about it, the answer, nobody, is disturbing. And when our students come to us, they're in, I think, pretty much the same position as the Soviet official. They have no idea how complex, how astonishing, how mysterious the economic system really is. Uh, I think that getting them involved, getting them interested in the subject that we all love, should be downhill all the way. It should be very, very easy. Uh, and, and I hope I've given you some of my ideas as to how we could do it. So I'm happy to take questions and thank you very much for listening.